Toronto 2008, and another honor for multi-award winning record producer, composer and arranger, Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is proof of, of the greatness of a, of a single human being. He's unbelievable. You can't believe what he's done. You can't. His roots were all about jazz. His destiny was all about music. He's one of the sort of the few people left that's a living legend, you know. It's music that stood the test of time. Soul Bossa Nova from the 60s was used in the recent Austin Powers films. Mr. Jones, you've got to get your mojo working overtime, baby. Quincy Jones produced Michael Jackson's albums in the 80s, including the best-selling album of all time. One thing that, that I think uh, that worked for us was we didn't have time for paralysis from analysis. <laughs> We've made Thriller in eight weeks. But Quincy's career started long before Thriller. In the 50s and 60s, he was a band leader, composer and arranger. I never know when Quincy's done the things, you know. I read about it in the paper, I go, oh, God, he did that. I didn't know, you know, just, like Fly Me to the Moon, I didn't know. Fly me to the moon. He worked with all the great artists, from Frank Sinatra to Dinah Washington to Ray Charles. In the heat of the night. He composed the scores of many memorable films. He was the first black executive in the record industry, and he's been producing for 40 years. If you just could hit it a little bit more, articulate a little bit more, because I, I heard you do it once. But now we brought about twist. He's embraced every genre of music, jazz, soul, funk, pop and rap, and become a successful film and television producer with hits like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And He's covered so much ground as a musician, as a producer, as a record guy, as a family man. I mean, he's covered so much ground, it's almost impossible to think is he's still here. This two-part series explores the rags-to-riches story of Quincy Jones, who, through his seven decades of music, has won more Grammy Awards than any other living artist. Quincy Jones began his professional career in New York in 1951 with a Lionel Hampton band. He was just 18. It was like being in heaven to be with all those musicians. And they, they had musicians that had been with all the big bands, you know. Quincy had joined one of the hottest bands of the day at the best venue in town, Harlem's legendary Apollo Theater, where crowds flocked to see their jazz heroes. Lionel Hampton was bigger than Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, or Count Basie at that time. He went for the throat, and he was not happy until he had everybody jumping out of their seats off the ceiling. Quincy was already writing music at 18. His first recorded piece was The Kingfish, co-written with his band leader, Lionel Hampton. That's the first record I ever made. First record I ever made. I wrote the arrangement, wrote the tune, and played. First record I ever made in my life, y'all. 18. Touring with Lionel Hampton, Quincy learned about a musician's life on the road. I used to just shut up and listen and watch what the older guys did, you know, uh, how to survive on the road. They'd take their pants and fold their pants and put it under the mattress at night before they went to bed. 
uh, that we have wash and wear shirts. You'd wash your shirt out and hang it on the uh, in the shower. Uh, and the same with your coat, and steam it. Put the hot water on to steam it, and you wash your nap your handkerchief, uh, uh, and bring it out and put it on the mirror. And the next morning, it was like it had been pressed. And, and I learned all this from these guys. I mean, I just watched everything they did. And you have to learn your music, how to read your music fast, because if, if you have to read your music, you can't see the girls. <laughs> and, and if you memorize the parts, you can look around and see what's going on. You know, I learned that from the old guys, too. Learn how to read your music fast, <laughs> really fast. Singer Ernestine Anderson sometimes performed with the band. He always had a number of things going on in his head at one time, and, and you know, we used to like, wait a minute. <laughs> the band often toured the Southern American states, which had racial segregation laws. All through the South, it was terrible. All the water fountains were white and colored. Uh, the bus stations were white and colored. The restaurants, forget about it. You know, we always used to have white bus drivers to go get us food in the restaurants. I hadn't seen that kind of stuff before. We hit this one city when the sun first came up, and from the biggest church steeple in, in the city was a, a effigy of a black dummy with a rope around his neck. You know, it, it, was, it was no joke. I'm, I'm serious, honey. It all came as a shock to a boy who'd been born in the North. Quincy Delight Jones Jr. entered the world on the 14th of March, 1933, a healthy new citizen of Chicago. Thousands of African Americans migrated here to escape the segregation of the South. Quincy's origins are typical of those whose ancestors were slaves. But that's what used to happen on plantations, you know. Our family is black. French, Cherokee Indian, and Welsh. This was the golden age of jazz. Great band leaders like Duke Ellington and Count Basie played on the radio and toured America, often with singers like the legendary Billie Holiday. Hey there, baby, make up your mind, cause I've been waiting such a long, long time. Now, baby, I'll never... Quincy Jones Sr., a skilled carpenter, loved the dance halls and duke joints. His mother, Sarah, was intelligent and highly educated. My mother, brilliant, brilliant woman. She went to the University of Boston in the 20s, which is very rare for a black woman, and new languages, multi-languages. She was very smart. Quincy had a brother, Lloyd, who was two years his junior. I felt an innate instinct to protect him all the time because I, I, somehow I could feel his vulnerability even when I was very young. And every picture we're taking, I'm holding him like, oh, don't you come near him. There was a great deal to protect his brother from. Their mother suffered from schizophrenia. My mother went to a mental hospital when I was seven, when my brother was, was uh, six or five. We were so young, we didn't really understand what's going on until we got there and we saw these people. Heavy, really heavy. 